For a time, we tried to contact him by radio, but no response. Yes, sir, folks, the wait is finally over. And as you heard from the intro there, from the radio wave straight to your podcast ears, the Dumb Marks has finally launched. You're listening to your boy, Steve Santoro, along my co-host, Chris Jobes. And man, I'm just excited to be on the air live, breaking down, giving our takes from the takes of the takers and spreading that overall goodness to your ears. Our very first episode. I can't believe it's here. This week on the Dunmarks Podcast, we're going to give you uh, our takes on uh, AEW All Out. We're still recovering from our hangover on that. Uh, we're also going to give you our drink of the week. And after the drink of the week, we'll, we're going to talk to you about the NFL season starting up next week on September 10th. Um, we're going to give you our our takes on who's going to win the division and what the season's going to look like. Uh, after we discuss the NFL season, we'll also hit you up with what you're going to expect with the Dumb Marks podcast. Uh, we're going to be live every Monday, so make sure you find us on your favorite podcast station, and you know we're just going to start off with All Out. Uh, Steve, how'd, how'd you feel about All Out overall? Overall, good, good show. Uh... You know, as far as their their pay per views have come in in their short time that they've been around, you know, coming up on a year here, um, I would say you know relatively in the middle, not not their best outing by far, but overall good show for what they consider to be their quote unquote WrestleMania. Uh, strong some strong matches, other stuff I felt you know was more of a. TV TNT dynamite type of show, but uh, overall, I was I was pleased with it for sure. I definitely agree. I you know, it four hour pay per view definitely came off feeling like an extended version of Dynamite this week. Um, you know, it's fifty dollars for their pay per view, so let's review the matches and then you know at the end we'll discuss. Do I feel that it was worth the fifty dollars that we spent tonight? Yeah, and before we hop in that, I just want to bring up one thing. You know, they they started bringing back live crowds to AEW, first first wrestling promotion to have live crowds mm-hmm. since the pandemic started. Um, I believe they were upwards to around 500 people in the crowd tonight. Uh, from what I could see, everybody was spread out in their quote-unquote family pod. People had masks on, social distancing was there. Now they're at Daly's Place, which is an amphitheater right next to the Jaguars' home stadium. There, TIA Bank Field there, and um, I don't know. For me, one of the things was you couldn't necessarily hear the crowd throughout the show. They were they were light at times. Sometimes it felt like there was no noise at all. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that was because of the spacing and how far they had people spread out between each other as well as the different levels within the amphitheater. So noise may not carry as well there without having a a, a roof, a hard, you know, a hard cover on top of the place. Um, But I'm hoping that's something that'll change going forward. Maybe it was just the people that were there tonight. Who knows? But I I definitely felt like the the crowds were a little light. Um, It'd be interesting to hear if, if the performers felt that way at all. But, um, you know, I'd like to hear some more crowd interaction considering they had 500 people in the stands there. And you figure after five months of not being able to go to a live wrestling show, that crowd should have been over the top loud and over the yeah. top aggressive as far as chance and being involved with the show. So maybe it had something to do with the show. Maybe it was the spacing. Who knows? But I'm definitely curious and keeping an eye on that going forward to see if, if that changes at all. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think that's definitely something that, you know, in the past when WrestleMania goes outdoors, you know, that once they go in those open air stadiums that, you know, the crowd noise definitely leaves the building. You know, it doesn't stay confined like whenever they're in a, a closed arena. Um, and as we know, I mean, pro wrestlers feed off of the crowd noise, you know, so whenever they can't tell how the crowd's really reacting, sometimes that that does affect the match a little bit. Um, granted, you know, we're now going through multiple months of, of this uh, COVID pandemic and they haven't had crowds in there, so they've had to learn how to play off no crowd. Um, but maybe, you know, sometimes during the night we felt like some of the matches were off and maybe they were expecting the crowd to give them a little bit more reaction than what they were getting. Yeah, and, and Jericho was on Busted Open Radio this week with Dave LaGreca and Bully Ray, and they were asking him about when he first came out and the crowd was singing his theme song again mm-hmm. and, and actually hearing the crowd. And to him, you know, it felt like being in Madison Square Garden in front of 16,000 people. And he said the crowd was live and upbeat the entire night through Dynamite. So I don't know, maybe if it's just mic placement that it's not picking up the crowd and the performers are actually hearing them a lot more than it comes across on the TV screen. But uh, I'd be interested interested to see if they tweak things moving forward to to get more more crowd noise coming across on, on the screen itself. I mean, absolutely. I think that, you know, I, I actually feel that this past week on Dynamite, the crowd reaction was stronger than what it was during all out. I would agree with that. Definitely. There was more, more crowd noise than yeah. tonight for and sure. I th- yeah. You definitely brought up a good point about Mike placement. I think maybe, maybe that had something to pl- do with it. You know, um, unfortunately we don't know what they're doing on the production side of things with this right now. So, um, you know, I think there, it's still a work in progress. You know, it, it's something that, you know, isn't going to be fixed, you know, off of this, off of all out. I think this week, you know, having that same crowd, size crowd in daily place, you know, we'll we'll try something different. And, you know, probably the week after, we'll try something different after that until they kind of feel like, you know, they got the, the formula right. Right. No. Agreed. Um, and I think that, I think the crowd noise kind of pulls us into the the opening match of All Out, you know, it was Big Swole versus Britt Baker. This was a tooth and nail match and was a cinematic type match. You know, originally this week they announced it on the pre-show and... Uh, the fan reaction on social media, you know, had this match being moved onto the main card. And Tony Khan had said this week, you know, during his media call that the reason why the match was being put on the pre-show was because it was a cinematic match. They were having fans back in uh, Daily Place for All Out, and they just felt the match wasn't going to fit a pay-per-view with a live crowd in attendance. You know, they, If it would have just been no crowd, they would have had it on the main card, but... Um, I do think that maybe he had the right, he had the right decision, you know, with that type of match being cinematic and being pre-taped, you know, wanting to put that on the pre-show. I think overall the storyline deserved to be on the main card. Yeah. Um, it's probably out of all the matches on the card tonight, it has had the most longevity story-wise. Yeah, I would agree um, with that. Definitely. I feel, um, you know, that first match of the pay-per-view is, is just as important as the main event because mm-hmm. it sets the tone. It gets the, the yeah, crowd absolutely. revved up. Um, it gives the wrestlers in the back the 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 idea of, you know, you want to walk back through the curtain and go, hey, hey beat that, top mm-hmm. that. So to kick it off with a cinematic match that was pre-taped in a doctor's office in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, shout out to Brooke mm-hmm. Baker, graduate of Pitt, Dental School and University of Pittsburgh, uh, fellow Pitt alumni here. So I definitely feel they could have picked a different match to start the pay-per-view with. I am glad that they switched it over to the main card just because, like you said, storyline-wise, it deserved to be on the main pay-per-view card. But as far as a show opener goes, I don't think I would have put it on first. Yeah, I I definitely agree. Um, I think Nate... I think they, they did it just they didn't want to take away from any of the crowd, you know. Um, they didn't want to start with a live crowd match and then, you know, maybe suck the life out of them with going to a pre-tape match. Um, I did feel that the opening 
kind of started off rough. Um, you know, there's a couple punches that Big Swole threw that just didn't really connect right. And same with Britt and, uh, and Reba. I just felt like it just lacked a little bit. And, like, that momentum just really didn't build up as the match went on. Yeah, and I think you, you touched on it there, but as we'll we'll see when we get through further in, you know, I don't know if it was due to humidity there tonight in Jacksonville and that, but there were a lot of quote-unquote watches or mishaps mm-hmm. or dangerous spots where people slipped off the ropes or whatever, but there were a couple times watching it where I actually like took a deep breath in because I was worried for the performer safety with a couple of spots. Absolutely. And as a fan, you never want to be watching that and have that be the message that's coming through the screen. Mm-hmm. So like I said, I don't know if it was because it was a hot and humid night and you know the ring gets slick, the ropes are slipped, your wrestling boots, you know, there's not a lot of traction on those. So I would be cautious as a performer going out there. And if I'm seeing other people having issues, maybe you tweak things in your match because, you know, you are you need to protect each other out there. Yeah. You don't want to go out there and do something, even if it's just, I mean, we saw, you know, I don't want to jump too far ahead here, but we saw Matt Seidel in the, all, in the buy-in battle royal where he almost, completely lost his life yeah. on that shooting star press that he's hit. I don't think I've ever seen him miss one. And Yeah, I think he's always hit that perfect anytime I've right. seen him. Right, so, you know, I um, I don't know if anything's going to come out more about it, if anybody's going to talk about it, but, you know, that's one of the things, I think, that progressed through the night where it was an issue in matches. Yeah, and I'm actually going to give a shout-out to a friend of the podcast, WWE Jason. Um, he actually brought up to me the other day saying that he thinks that in AEW, they show more botches than what you see in the WWE. You know, where WWE kind of can protect themselves a little bit better in the ring and their production value kind of edits that out. You know, so you see more, a more smooth product. Where whenever you're watching AEW, you're seeing just... Like life in general, stuff happens, you know. Everything can't be perfect 24-7. Right, yeah. No, you're you're definitely taking a risk anytime you go out there for sure. Um, you know, maybe they, maybe they need to... I don't know if they need to shoot differently as far as camera angles and whatnot to make it look like it comes across cleaner. Mm-hmm. I'm not... I don't know how much of that you can do during a... A live broadcast. Yeah. Um, but they, uh, you know, this is the first time that I noticed it tonight. Yeah. And, Definitely a lot and they, more. Tonight. And they've been in Daly's place since the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, it could have just been tonight specific related to humidity, whatever. But like I said, there was a lot more spots tonight in, in you know matches throughout the evening where. I was a little worried and wondering, are they going to be able to pull this off without somebody getting seriously hurt? Yeah. And I mean, I think definitely in the tooth and nail match, being a cinema match and being pre-taped, you expect it to look smoother. You know, you have the time to stop the shoot, you know, regroup, retape, whatever, to make it come off better. Um, It kind of felt to me that maybe this was done, you know, not necessarily in one take, but they kind of had it seem like we're just going to run through this match and that's going to be it. You know, it's we're not going to keep going back and redoing stuff. Um, it even got to the ending, you know, where I felt like the ending just fell off. Um, you know, Big Swole had put the gas on Dr. Britt and Pinder, and then like, not even a minute after the match was over, you know, Britt's coming out of the gas. Yeah. And, I mean, you kind of seemed like you had an issue with that, too, while we were watching it. Yeah, it just... It's hard to to know exactly what's going on inside their minds as it's going on, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, 
I don't think it was like a an egregious, you know, Shawn Michaels no sell that happened on Raw a couple weeks ago with Randy Orton. Um, you know, for what it was, it was it was okay as far as cinematic matches go. Production wise, it's nowhere near what WWE put into theirs with the you know the Boneyard match at mm-hmm. WrestleMania. Um, between Champa and Gargano with theirs, uh, Edge and Orton, Last Man Standing, um, you know, maybe not even as good of a production as the uh, Stadium Stampede match. Yeah, no, yeah. nowhere, nowhere near. But you know, if you listen to Jericho's podcast when he broke down that Stadium Stampede match, that was like a. 14 hour movie set yeah. shoot where they were rushing to wrap up by six o'clock in the morning before the sun rose because it was a nighttime match. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know how much time Swollen Baker had or who was in charge of it producer wise and that. I think they did the best with what they had. There was definitely some highs. I'd say a little bit more lows than highs in a match, but for their first foray into a cinematic style match wasn't the best out the gates. Yeah. And I definitely think that, you know, it being the match to set the whole night, it kind of gave us the feeling of what the whole night had in store for us. Um, we'll move on to the next match, which I kind of am going to consider the, the real opening match of the night. Um, it was a tag team match between the Young Bucks and Jurassic Express. Um, I think this is like where... AEW does shine in their tag team division, and they put two of their best tag teams, in my opinion, to kind of start off the live event crowd. You know, both teams are very energetic, and they can kind of, you know, get the crowd pumped for the rest of the night. Yeah, I I would agree with that. You know, Young Bucks, um, slow burn with them since AEW started. A lot of people thought they'd be champs right off the bat. You know, they, they set up private party in the tag team tournament, you know, upset victory there, putting them over, trying Mm -hmm. to build teams within the division that people may not know about, considering they have the most name value. But as you'll see, and as you brought up, tag team wrestling is definitely valued in AEW. There's a strong emphasis on it. There were a lot of tag team matches on this card. Now, whether it's just this card specifically, who knows, but it's definitely value. It's definitely time put into it. And they definitely did a good job of bringing the energy to a pay-per-view on a pay-per-view. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Young Bucks defeat the Jurassic Express in this exchange. And I think that, you know, like you said, it's been a slow burn for them since AEW started. I think not just with them, but I think everybody expected Cody, the Young Bucks, and Kenny Omega to kind of come out and hold some gold very early on. Um, you know, Cody's held the TNT championship now and Kenny's had tag team gold. So right now out of the original elite, the young bucks are the only ones that haven't tasted gold yet in AEW. Um, you know, we'll cover, I think we're going to cover that a little bit later on whenever we talk about the AEW world tag team championship match, um, to see what the future has in store for that. Um, so let's move on next to the, uh, 21 man casino battle Royal. Um, I, this is a match that I that has normally been on the buy-in, you know, in the past. And, you know, the winner of this match gets a future AEW World Championship match. Uh, I think they put it on the main card just for that reason. You know, they were going to kind of hype whoever the next number one contender is going to be. Um, I felt the whole match fell flat, um, you know, from start to finish. Um, the only part that kind of had a high point was whenever Matt Seidel, who was a surprise entrant, came out. And as you spoke on earlier, you know, just ha- unfortunately had a, a bad uh, malfunction in the ring whenever he was trying to hit a shooting star press. Um, How did you feel about the match overall? Yeah, I felt the same way. It was definitely the weakest of the buy-in battle royales mm-hmm. that they've done. Um for me, the biggest disappointment in and of it was I felt like the winner who was Lance Archer, to me, that already told me the outcome of the main event. Yeah. 
And not that, you know, you don't, you don't ever want to spoil your main event by something done earlier on the show. Yeah. And, and for me, just looking at it and matchup wise, Lance Archer wins that. To me, that right there said, okay, John Moxley's not losing this heavyweight title match. So John already Moxley. there's a disconnect in, in me looking negatively towards the main event before we even get there. Um, Archer's not a bad choice. You know, he had his his run through the TNT Championship Tournament, met Cody in the finals, lost there. Do I necessarily see him as a top guy? No. Uh, they did have a very good match in New Japan when them, mm-hmm. when them two face each other. Maybe they can recreate that magic that they had, and it's for sure going to be a slugfest. You're not going to get a five-star technical wrestling match with those two in the ring. Uh, Promo-wise, should be pretty good with Jake and Moxley going back and forth on mm-hmm. the stick. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely took me out of the main event before we even got to the main event. Yeah, I agree. I I feel like, uh, you know, when Lance Archer debuted, you know, especially with Jake the Snake, you know, being his mouthpiece, um, he had a lot, he, they brought him in with a lot of momentum. Um, I think they did a lot with him and even, uh, I don't think necessarily that they planned on putting the, the tag title or the TNT title on him right away, but. I think that they had some type of run in mind for him. And when, after Cody won the TNT championship, I just feel like Lance Archer's just kind of not necessarily been pushed aside. He just hasn't been highlighted as much as he was before that. Um, so to see him come out and win this match with really no build up, you know, I just felt like it was a meh kind of win for this to say that he's the number one contender now. Um, I do agree with you saying that it did kind of give a spoiler on what the the ending to the main event of the night was going to be. And we'll get to that match in a little bit as well. Um, the next match on the card was Matt Hardy versus Sammy Guevara. Um, it was a broken rules match. So <laughs> the ruling of the match was supposed to be that the only way to win was that you couldn't... Uh, answer the count of 10. So, and that's, you know, basically being a last man standing match. Um, yeah, Matt Hardy died and came back to life yeah. in this match. That was the scariest <laughs> bump I've ever seen in wrestling. And I've yeah. been watching wrestling for over 30 years. Yeah. I don't know if this was a match that they had previously taped or if it was live. It, it had to have been live. There was no way that they pre, there was no way that they taped that. And the only reason why I'm saying that is because of, the ref Aubrey Edwards' reaction yeah. to him coming off and her throwing up the X very quickly too. Very quickly, which anytime you see that, you know a, a wrestler is seriously injured yeah. and and probably shouldn't continue. Um, Matt was out on his feet there for a long time, and they finally decided to call it off. The doctor came out. Sammy started walking away, heading back towards into the ring area. And then for some reason, who knows what's going to, why it even happened, but they let Matt Hardy continue the match. They come back into the arena, a couple quick hitters, climb up scaffolding. Now this goes to show you what type of sense does this make? The man literally almost died. If he doesn't have a concussion, I'll be surprised. I, I don't know how he could walk away without a concussion after taking that bump. Then he has to climb up scaffolding probably 15 feet in the air to push Sammy off through tables, who looked like he took a nasty bump and hurt his shoulder mm-hmm. really bad, um, for him to be counted out, not answer to 10 count, and Matt win. Yeah. So, you know, you have some disconnect there. Story wise, within the match, why wasn't Aubrey counting Matt for the 10 when he fell exactly. off and was laying there flat and wasn't moving? She throws up the X right away, but doesn't count him at all. And at one point, they even called for the bell. They called for the bell, yeah. but then there was an announcement as Matt was walking into the ring area that 
I believe it was Justin Roberts came across and you heard him say, we've been told that there must be a winner to this match. So I don't know if back in the back, they're like, no, hey, guys, you need to at least give us a couple more minutes time-wise because we're not going to be able to fill. But, and JR said it on the broadcast, you know, at what point do you, do you worry about health and safety and just exactly. end, the, end the damn match? There's no reason for him to be out there after he falls off of the scissor lift the way that he did. I mean, I don't know. that. There's probably going to be a lot of talk about that. Yeah. I would hope there'd be a lot of talk about that because it's an instance where you should have put the performer's safety first and not worry about finishing the match. And I mean, the in, so overall, this match had was a nine-minute match is what, you know what they're calling for it. Um, I'd say, what would you say about the two to three minute matches whenever, you know, he fell off the scaff? It was right in the beginning. I mean, yeah, you're, you're talking three minutes in and, and, you know, so he falls off, you know, yeah, you, yeah, you cut a match short, you know, then you can have a match go a little bit longer, you know, any match on the rest of the card. There's still five more matches after this. You know, that you can give a little bit of extra time to. So if they're worried about time, that's not so much an issue. I'm sure any one of these talented performers could stretch their match another five minutes or so. Um, especially at the health and the cost of the well-being of the performer. I agree with you. I mean, I think that, you know, Matt was literally on the ground for probably a good minute. That I would say uh, even longer than yeah, that. That I mean, Aubrey could have just, they could have just told Aubrey in her earpiece, hey, count to ten, the match is over. You yeah. know, and... You know, yeah, they had a big bump to end the match where Sammy fell off, you know, inside Daly's place. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that was the original planned ending to begin with. Right. You know, they wanted to go with it and they tried. But, uh, yeah, I just don't know if Matt's health was worth the risk of continuing just to get to that bump, you know, for an extra couple minutes of a match. Agreed. Absolutely agreed. Um, so after that, we move into the AW Women's World Championship. Uh Champion Cheetah took on NWA Women's Champion Thunder Rosa. Um, you know, this is a match that, you know, most people have were surprised whenever it was booked because no one expected an AEW-NWA crossover match. No, but I think, which is smart of Tony Khan and big ups to him for actually reaching out to Billy Corgan and saying, hey, you know, we'd like to work together here. What do you think about having your women's champion come in and challenge our women's champion. Yeah. You know, the back in the day, you had territories and champions went to this territory and stayed for a while, and then they would leave and go to other territories. And the WWE came in and broke that system up, as we all know, and turned into this monopoly of professional wrestling. Now... You're in the era, you have Impact, you have AEW, you have MLW, you know, there's some other indie promotions um, that are on the bigger scale. And to me, if you can partner with the NWA, why not do a match here or there to bring talent over? You know, Ricky Starks came from NWA, Mm -hmm. now signed with AEW. Eddie Kingston came from NWA, now signed with AEW. We saw what Cody and Nick Aldis did going into All In before AEW officially launched as a company. Um, So there is some background there for working together. Mm -hmm. And I feel that can only help the two promotions going forward. And I'm sure down the line... When NWA calls Tony and goes, hey, you know, remember when we gave you Thunder Rosa for All Out? Why don't you send XYZ over to us to help build our brand up some? Thunder Rosa is a great champion, great worker. To me, this was my initial pick for a match of the night. I felt both women went out there and performed well. Um Really like Thunder Rosa. Love her in Lucha Underground as Cobra Moon. Knew her there. Um, I feel that they put forth a good effort. They both drew eyes to the women's division. And like I said, I hope in the future they can they can work together more. Yeah, I agree. I think um, I think it was very smart. It was a match that no one expected. No one saw coming ahead of time. Um, you know, 
I have watched the NWA a little bit uh, on YouTube with their with their power show. Um, and the NWA and AEW are two different style of productions. You know, AEW feeds off the live crowd, where NWA is very old school, you know, studio, studio wrestling. wrestling. Yep. And 605 TBS, exactly. studio wrestling. And, I, you know, I think that um, between the two promotions, the NWA has more to gain with being with AEW, AEW than AEW has with the NWA. Um, other than the NWA has, I think, is just, an, it's an older and more respected brand value. You know, that could give AEW a little bit of brand notoriety that, you know, instead of just being an upstart promotion. Um, yeah, we'll see what we'll see what happens with NWA going forward. Here yeah. they they announced they're going to be doing whether it's bi weekly or weekly shows, kind of like how TNA did back in the day whenever they mm-hmm. first started up. Um, you know, before the pandemic hit, they were rolling with the NWA Power on YouTube. Yeah. Tuesdays at six o'clock. You know that was a, a good hour of solid professional wrestling. They have some talent there that definitely were can be seen from other promotions. You know, you had Eli Drake, James Storm, obviously Nick Aldis, the women's division there. You had Thunder Rosa as a champion, but Melina was there. Um, You got Camille, you know, so they definitely have talent there. And, you know, hopefully for them, they can figure out how to work their way back into the viewing era of, you know, getting an audience back and having more eyes on their product. And I think Thunder Rosa wrestling tonight will definitely draw more eyes to NWA. Absolutely. I mean, I, the outcome didn't surprise me with Sheeta retaining the championship. Um, you know, she's been the workhorse of the women's division, especially during this whole pandemic. Um, you know, a lot of talent not being able to be used in AEW right now, but you know, she's been highlighted. And I think whenever she came out tonight, they said, you know, her 2020 record is 16 and two, you know, that's a hell of a record. And you know, um, there's not too many men that have the, that record going on right now. Right. And I mean, if you look, you know, you have Sheeta in AEW, you have Asuka on Raw, mm-hmm. both women from Japan. Yeah. You know, Io Shirai in NXT from Japan. So, you know, women's wrestling, especially in Japan, is strong. And those names that you may not know are definitely becoming more on the front of your tongue when talking about women's professional wrestling yes. and she does should definitely put in the conversation of women that have not only excelled during this no fan era of professional wrestling but you know one that should be considered as you know whatever you want to do your top five list or top 10 list or however you want to break it down she she's definitely a name that you have to put on the list as so is thunder rosa yeah I mean, I think definitely when we're talking, you know, maybe five, ten years down the road, the people that help build the women's division, AEW, Sheeta is going to be one of the first names that come, rolls off your tongue. Um, I would have maybe like to have seen Thunder Rosa win the match tonight, just for a little bit of shock value. Um, but you know, I I'm a big fan of Sheeta, so I definitely don't have any complaints on her winning and retaining and moving on forward. You know, continuing her reign. What was next on the card? Uh, we got the eight man tag team match. Eight, yeah, eight man tag team match. Um, the Dark Order versus the Natural Nightmares. This is probably the second match on the card that I feel should have been on the buy in instead of on the main card of the night. Um, it definitely continued the dark, the little bit of the Dark Order internal battle. You know, with Colt Cabana. You know, is he a real member of the Dark Order? Um, you know, earlier on the buy-in, the Dark Order had lost, so, you know, there was kind of, oh, how's Birdie Lee going to handle this, you know? Uh, is he going to punish the guys or, or what? And that kind of is how the the end of the match felt, you know, what's Birdie Lee going to do next? I wasn't excited for this match, and the reason why, there was little to no build. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it came about due to the way the match between Brody and Cody ended, and, you know, the Dark Order just devastating and eliminating Cody and Arn Anderson. We still don't have an update on Cody and when he was going to return yeah. um, from injury, quote unquote. But, you know, to me, it just seemed, it just seemed thrown together to get people on the show. Um, 
you have the Nightmare, you know, the Nightmare Collective and Dustin and, and QT, Matt Cardona, and then for whatever reason, Scorpio Sky gets thrust into this. I don't even know if you want to call it a feud, yeah. but gets thrust into this by running down and helping, you know, there's no explanation, no background. Why was Scorpio yeah. involved? What, you know, what made him come out? Matt Cardona, obviously, Cody's longtime best friend or really close friend, obviously with Dustin and QT being taken out by the Dark Order on, the, on Dynamite when Brody beat Cody for the belt. Um I could have done without this match on the card, to be honest with you. Yeah. And, I mean, covering Scorpio Sky a little bit more, too, it's... there. He came out with new theme music. You know, didn't come out with the SC, SCU theme music. So, it's like, it makes you question, okay, is he still part of SCU, or is he on his own now? And, you know, there's been no real, like, firm decision on that, you know, of what's going on. If they... Put him out on his own. I mean, the kid's talented. I mean, he has a bright future ahead of him. Probably going to be a future world champion, whether it be in AEW or somewhere else. Um, I yeah, I just don't think adding him to this match really added any value to it. Um, you know, I remember back in the day, JR would talk about uh, the WrestleMania card. How, you know, WrestleMania is supposed to be the WWE Super Bowl. And if All Out is AEW Super Bowl, it's... The card isn't supposed to be everybody get a paycheck night. It's supposed to be the best of the best and, you know, whatever stories they've been building up to, you know, finishing them off and working towards building new feuds, after, you know, starting this week. And I just felt like this was an eight-man match put on the card just to give everybody a paycheck for the night. Yeah, I would, I would um, you know, that's no no knock on the talent. They went out there, worked hard. No, absolutely they, not. They, they did have a good a good match, but like I said, this wasn't one where I was on the edge of my seat waiting for this eight man tag and going, mm-hmm. man, I tell you what, the the bad blood between these eight men is really going to shine through and come through in, on, in this match. And to me, it's just, yeah, you know, it's set up for a Dustin and Brody TNA championship match on Wednesday, so we'll see what happens there. Mm-hmm. But other than that. You know, like I said, I could deal without this and, and would have wanted maybe something else in its place. Yeah. All right, boys and girls, we're going to pause the AEW All Out results right here, and we're going to continue them on next week's show. Uh, unfortunately, during our recording of the AEW All Out results, Steve literally got hit with a shitstorm at home. Um, we wanted to still get this show out to you as promised, so next week, tune in for part two of our reaction to AEW All Out and what I can only expect to be one hell of a story from Steve. Chug, 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 chug. chug. This week's Drink of the Week segment is brought to you by Bad Decisions, sending late night texts to your exes, and next day hangovers. All right, this week's Drink of the Week is Saranac Pumpkin Ale. Uh, Every week on... We're going to be talking about different drinks, beers, mixed drinks, you know, whatever we feel like drinking that week. Uh, We'll probably try different things that we've never had before. So if you have any requests on what you want us to try, you know, shoot us a message on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever. Uh, Each week we're going to go on our sumo scale. You know, if you've seen our logo, we have two sumos on there for me and Steve. So one sumo is going to be the worst, five sumos being the best. Uh, we're each going to try the pumpkin ale here, and we'll let you know what we think. All right, if you've never had the Saranac pumpkin ale, uh, just to give you a heads up, it is 5.3 alcohol percentage. Um, definitely a fall beer, you know, has the pumpkin and the spices flavoring in there. I kind of feel like the taste is really light. Yeah, it is. I'd say on out of all the pumpkin ales that I've had, this one is kind of light on the overall pumpkin flavor. Uh, to me, it's more brewed in, in the realm of, say, an Oktoberfest. Yeah. If you're looking up for a fall beer-wise. Uh, this one's definitely good straight out the bottle. You know, some some pumpkin ales you, you tend to add cinnamon to, to to give it a little bit more flavor. This one's nice, cool, crisp, refreshing. I would definitely 
definitely say that uh, this one is is in my my upper echelon of pumpkin ales. Um, price wise, very good for the, for the price range. There, it's not o- not overly expensive like some of the other pumpkin ales that are out there on the market. But I would say overall, good beer, great first choice for for a drink of the week. And I would uh, on my scale, I would probably go with a four out of five sumos. Okay. Yeah, it's def- I mean, very light beer flavor. Uh, I don't. I've got about quarter way down already, and I don't feel it's real heavy. Um, I don't feel like there's a ton of pumpkin flavor, but definitely picking up on the spices. Uh, you mentioned like cinnamon. I think if much like a pumpkin, you know, where whenever you go to a, a decent uh, restaurant or bar, and they do like the rim with the pump. Like the cinnamon on the yep. on the room for that, yeah, you know, gives it that extra flavor profile, and I think that would be good with this as well. Um, out of the bottle, I'm gonna give it a three out of five sumos. Um, I think if I if I did have like the extra little bit of cinnamon on there, I think it probably I might be up in your four range, you know, just to elevate the profile a little bit more. All right. All right, guys. Well, there you have it. Uh, first drink of the week. You know, three and a half out of five for Chris there. I'm going to go with uh, four out of five for myself on the Saranac Pumpkin Ale. And, um, you know, at the, the end of each drink of the week segment here, we're going to ask everybody to grab your drink, raise a glass, and uh, give a little toast here to good ships and wood ships and ships that sail the seas. But the best ships are friendships, and friends will always be. Salute. All right, Chris, you know it's that time of year, especially here in Western PA where football is king. We're getting ready to kick off the NFL season 2020. Didn't think it would happen, honestly, with COVID. We'll see if they'll be able to get through the entire year here. But uh, we know in Western PA, down there in stiller country, we're going to kick off the pigskin here and give you our picks for each divisional winners of the NFL. So we'll start off with the NFC North. NFC North, we got Green Bay, Minnesota, Chicago, and Detroit. Now, sleeper team for me in this division this year, and you may laugh, but I'm going to go with the Detroit Lions. Matt Stafford coming back this year. They had one of the, the best offenses last year before he got hurt with his broken back. You know, it's a make or break year for Coach Matt Patricia. Uh, the Lions could be sneaky team to not necessarily win the division, but get a wild card berth. Um, moving forward, Aaron Rodgers didn't get any weapons in the draft. Instead, Green Bay go was, goes with a backup quarterback that's probably not going to see the field for four years. Uh, got ran all over the field in the NFC Championship game last year. We'll see what their defense looks like uh, and if they can stop the run moving forward. Minnesota, strong team both ways. Lou Stephon Diggs uh, pick up you know a late trade here in the offseason from Jacksonville with Yannick and Glockway. So... I'm going to have to say, if I'm I'm going to go out here and go, um, let's go with the Vikings winning the division this year. But don't be surprised if Detroit pushes them coming up in either wild card spot or surprisingly wins the division. Um, I wouldn't be surprised either. I'm looking at the division right now. I'm not really going to be too far behind you. I think Detroit has a great chance of carrying it this year. Um, there's going to be a lot of factors what's going on this season with everything. You know, we were talking about this earlier that, you know, the NFL is going to be pumping in some crowd noise into the stadiums yep. uh, throughout the year, you know, whether it's the full season or if they let crowds back in at some point. Um, and who kn- it could be, you know, them pumping it in for the players or it could just be on TV. But, you know, the whole no crowd in the stadium could shake up these these players, you know, like it hasn't before because they definitely are like pro wrestlers. They feed off the crowd noise a lot of times. You know, that that energy gets their blood pumping and, you know, it gets that adrenaline going and really helps the games go more. I think Detroit has a great team. Um, I, I definitely see them carrying the division. All right. So next we'll move to the NFC West. We got Seattle, San Francisco, the Rams, and then the Cardinals. 
Uh, to me, everybody's hot pick would be the Arizona Cardinals. Kyler Murray coming back off of a strong rookie season. Um, that's my fantasy quarterback in my keeper league here. I kept him. You know, they bring in DeAndre Hopkins in a trade with Houston for peanuts and Cracker Jacks. Uh, Seattle, they just re-signed Josh Gordon. They're always a, a strong team. We'll see if they actually let Russell Wilson be Russell Wilson and do the things he does to quite possibly be an MVP candidate. The Rams, I don't know what's going to go on with the Rams this year. I can't really call it. Offense last year was so-so under McVay. You got Aaron Donald there who's strong. Um you know, my man Cam Akers from Florida State coming in in the draft as a running back there. Uh, and then San Francisco went to the Super Bowl last year. Debo Samuel's hurt, may start the year, may not start the year. That run game, Kittle gets a contract, defense. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go with Seattle in this division. I don't know, something, mm-hmm. something about Russell Wilson, you know, may not be the flashiest, you know, married to Sierra, um, I'm going to go with Russell Wilson up there in the great Northwest. I'm actually going to go with the sleeper, the L.A. Rams. Okay. Um, I, I'm sure not a lot of people are going to be choosing them. Um, my thinking strictly behind it is that a lot of eyes are going to be on them this season. You know, may not necessarily be so much on TV, but a lot of, you know, a lot of money was spent on this team recently. And they're going to expect something for that money that was spent. You know, and I, you know, if they can keep, you know, the expectation going of, you know, what the ownership wants, I think some more money needs to be spent on the team. But I think that, you know, the LA Rams are going to deliver something this season. Whether it takes them to the division win, who knows? But I think they're going to give us something this year. All right, moving on here, we'll go to the NFC East, Philadelphia, Dallas, Giants, and the Washington football team. Uh, what a disaster they got going on. <laughs> Investigations, poor culture, sexual harassment, who just everything under the sun. Um this division, man. If Philadelphia can stay healthy, um I like their chances. Dallas, I'm never gonna pick Dallas in anything. <laughs> um as a Steeler fan, I'm just not gonna do it. Although if Dak Prescott balls out and has a year like he had last year, it'll be very interesting to see if Jerry Jones decides to cut him a blank check at the end of the year and sign him for big-time money. You saw Deshaun Watson just get a big-time money deal here going forward. But give me the Eagles. I don't necessarily love them, and I hate picking them because they're from Philadelphia yeah. and we're from Pittsburgh and just everything about Philly stinks. But – uh. Yeah, give me the Eagles. Miles Sanders, Woody Highlam out there. Shout out to him. So I'll go with the Eagles just just for that case alone. I, I'm going to agree with you. It pains me to say, but I'm going with Philadelphia as well. I mean, the Washington football team, as they're being called right now, I mean, I, I don't think anybody's expecting anything from that team at all. I mean, it doesn't really, but, you know, especially this year. Um, you know, the Dallas Cowboys, I don't think any other team in the NFL – uh, owner expects more from his team than than Jerry Jones, um, but I, I mean I agree. It pains me, but I think Philadelphia Eagles. They bring in Mike McCarthy, you know, former Greenfield Greenfield native, you know, fellow Yenzer four one two guy. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, I, I, I like I said, I won't pick Dallas in anything. Yeah. All right, moving on. Last division in the NFC here. We got the NFC South: Carolina, Atlanta, New Orleans, and. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers with Brady going down to the Sunshine State, bringing in Gronk out of retirement. They just get Leonard Fournette off the waivers for nothing. You have Evans, Godwin. It, you know, it sounds almost like a uh, Madden, you know, EA Sports Madden draft team down there <laughs> that you got going on. Um, you know, of course, everybody's going to go Tampa Bay here um, just for the simple fact. Brady. Gronk, everybody that I mentioned. Carolina, they got Bridgewater, rookie head coach coming from college. Atlanta's a mess. They've been a less. Julio Jones, probably top two wide receiver in the league. 
for some reason is like allergic to the end zone, doesn't score touchdowns on a regular basis. Go figure that one out. New Orleans, Breeze coming up on the end here. Mike Thomas, uh, maybe they get you Davion Clowney here. Maybe not to help bolster that defense. They've had heartbreak the last two years in the playoffs, you know, with Minnesota getting the win um, on them last year on the Kyle Rudolph push-off and that. So I'm going to uh, – the hell, I'll go with everybody else and hop on the – no, I can't do it. I can't I can't pick Brady. He's from New – I can't do it. Not after all the years and all the years of seeing him throw for 400 yards on the Steelers defense and just, just being heartbroken year after year playing the Patriots. Can't do it. Give me uh, Breeze and the Saints. Okay. I mean – that doesn't surprise me. I mean, so the past couple of days, whenever I've been looking up a lot of uh, the Vegas insiders who they're expecting for the Super Bowl this year, um, everybody seems to be leaning towards the Saints going into the Super Bowl. Um, uh, I don't know why. I really don't know why. But I've been a Tampa Bay fan for a few years, um, even before they won their Super Bowl, uh, however many years ago that was. I don't even remember. Um, it's not always a good team. But, you know, there's something about that team that I like. Um, I don't know. I think that's going to change with me this year now that Brady and Kronk are on the team. I mean, I don't have, a, I really don't have a problem with Kronk. You know, another, technically another Woody High alum. Um, but I don't, I don't know if this is going to be the year for them. I think it's definitely going to be a rebuilding year for the team. You know, they're not going to have Belichick to go, you know, help them along like they normally would with the Patriots. Um, so you're really going to see, was it Belichick or was it Brady that, that made that team a dynasty? Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, as much as I do want to say Tampa Bay, I am also going to go with the Saints. All right. So that's the NFC breakdown here. Switching over to the AFC breakdown. We'll go to the AFC South first. Jacksonville, Indy, Tennessee, Houston. Jacksonville is clearly either tanking for Trevor or failing for Fields. They've gotten rid of anybody of notoriety and Tony Khan uh, and Shad Khan. Who knows what's going on there with the football operations in that in that team. Um, Indy gets Phillip Rivers. Houston, like I said, Bill O'Brien, big trade. DeAndre Hopkins for David Johnson. We'll see if David Johnson bounces back or is washed up. Tennessee. Derrick Henry, the man-child, um, you know, dwarfs NFL players by any means and, and stretches the field, uh, allowing Tannehill to throw down play action. I'm going to go with Indy here, uh, Phillip Rivers. I, I like their defense, really good offensive line. I think Phillip deserves to get one run here at a title possibly over this year and next year. So give me the Colts. All right. Uh, I'm a Tennessee fan. Um, I think I like the Titans. Um, I, th- I think they can be hit or miss. Um, but I think the past few seasons, I've, I've liked what I've seen. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm hoping this season they can go a little bit more of the distance. Um, you know, nobody ever expects Jacksonville to do anything. You know, it's just that team that's there. Um, I'm very happy that Tony Khan runs his wrestling promotion better than he runs his football team. It's very true. Um, You know, if Shad Khan can actually invest, you know, he invests money. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that with the team, but if they could actually position that money towards some quality players, you know, maybe in a few years we could see Jackson will do better, but definitely I'm going Tennessee. All right. AFC East, Buffalo, New England, the Jets and the Dolphins. To me, this is a two-team race. You know, Brady leaves. You figure the Patriots dynasty is dead. They have eight or nine players opt out before COVID-19 started the season here. And what does he do? Gets Cam Newton for a million dollars. That's all. Just Cam Newton. Out of work for 86 days. Post an Instagram workouts looking like the Incredible Hulk. (laughs) Chip on his shoulder. Carolina kicks him out after nine years. Oh, yeah, Belichick will swoop in and scoop him up for a million dollars. And then Buffalo, uh, Josh Allen, maybe a make it or break it year. Are you really that guy that can get Buffalo to the next level? You bring in Stephon Diggs, don't know how much that's going to help them out, considering the accuracy problems. They're a ground-and-pound team, defense, like their defense a lot. 
nobody cares about the Jets or the Dolphins right now. You know, I think the Dolphins are a year or two away. I like what Flores is doing down there. They got Tua. They got some other pieces in place. And then the Jets, Le'Veon might be washed up. Sam Darnold, hopefully he doesn't get mono for another year in a row here. But I don't see them doing anything. Gase will probably get canned after this year. So uh, I hate to do this, and I hate to say it, but give me the Patriots. <laughs> I didn't think I'd hear you say that, but. Me either. <laughs> um, no team in this division does anything for me. I mean, I'm one of those people that just hates the Patriots because you're supposed to hate the Patriots. I mean, uh, Buffalo doesn't do anything for me. Miami definitely doesn't do anything for me. I don't think my, Miami's another team that is just there. Um, and then I just can never pick New York for anything. Um, it's because I have to pick someone. Give me Miami. <laughs> it was the Vegas odds on that bet. Um, I'm not making it. <laughs> <laughs> AFC West. I don't even know if there's a need to break down this division. Kansas City, the defending Super Bowl champs, the half a billion dollar man, Patrick Mahomes. They get Clyde Edwards Hilaire in the draft in the first round. Andy Reid, Eric Bieniemy are just drawing up plays on the whiteboard. You know, like it's backyard football. Uh, Las Vegas Raiders, not much going on there. San Diego, up. Oh, I'm sorry, Los Angeles Chargers. Um, you know, Tyrod Taylor coming in. You got the young rookie, Justin Herbert. What's that going to look like? Derwin James just had knee surgeries out six to eight months, so he's gone for the year. Denver, nobody knows if Drew Locke is actually any good. Um, there's no reason to really go in-depth here. It's the half a billion dollar, man. Give me Patty Mahomes and the Chiefs. Absolutely. I mean, the you know the Raiders and the Chargers. It's just like what I said with the Rams. You know, money or the money's been spent on the teams. Um, can they deliver anything? You know, I think that's going to be the question. You know, there's going to be a little bit of eyes on them just for that alone. Um, Vegas odds have it on the Chiefs. I'm going with the Chiefs as well. All right. And last but not least, the AFC North, uh, Bengals with the young Joe Burrow. Baltimore with Lamar Jackson and that rushing attack. Cleveland, the mistake by the lake. Browns, God, if Cleveland ever gets a winner, I, they, you know, Ohio <laughs> might burn to the ground if Cleveland ever actually wins something. And then, of course, our very own Pittsburgh Steelers. Big Ben coming back. Juju, is he a number one? Are the Steelers going to re-sign him after this year, coming up on that rookie deal? I, I like Deontay Johnson a lot. Chase Claypool, from every indication that we've gotten out of camp from reports and all that, not players, tweets, uh, is supposedly going to be a problem. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Big Ben, if the elbow is healthy and the arm is right, you know, he's not the worst quarterback in the division. Um, <laughs> there, I don't even know why we're breaking it down like this. Steelers are winning the division, and yes, I'm a homer, and yes, I'm a yinzer. <laughs> Never going to vote anything for the Dirty Birds there in Baltimore. Cincinnati and Cleveland are train wrecks, although I do like Burrow and some of the pieces around him, but not yet, at least a year or two away. I could be proven wrong, but you never know. That picture of him smoking a cigar after the national championship Made me like him even more. Too bad he got drafted to the Bengals. But, you know, I'm going with the Steelers on that run for seven. Uh, taking the, the baby face route on this one, huh? Absolutely. Okay. Um, Cleveland, there is nothing coming out of Cleveland this season. Um, they had their year, what, two years ago, whenever, you know, the Bud Light cooler and everything. But they had a oh, couple yeah, wins. Free Bear if they didn't yeah. go in 16. That, 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 was, that was it for them. Um, I don't, I don't see anything coming out of that this season. I mean, there's talent there. You know, Stefanski's a good coach from Minnesota. We'll see if Baker Mayfield's any good. OBJ is actually going to be healthy this year. Was dealing with a sports injury last year. They brought in Austin Hooper from Atlanta. I don't, you know, can it actually come together and be anything worth a damn? And because it's Cleveland, I'm going to say hell no. <laughs> um, you know. Big Ben's a big question with our Steelers. You know, what's his health really going to be like? Um, 
Ben's a hell of a player. You know, has had more of a career than I really expected him to with us. You know, I I kind of figured he was going to be wrapping up a few seasons ago, and he just keeps continuing on. He he's a great quarterback. Um, I kind of feel like this is just another rebuilding year for the Steelers. Um, as much as I don't want to do this, I'm turning heel and I'm going Baltimore Ravens. Oh man, unbelievable! <laughs> All right, folks, there you have the breakdown for the for the picks for the football season. Uh, you know, we'll we'll go in depth more here week to week breakdown. Um, also touch on other sports, NBA, NHL, MLS, MMA, whatever you guys want to hear. Um, if you agree with our picks, let us know. If you disagree, tell us why. You know, hit us up on social media and let us know here. And um, that was the sports section brought to you by the Dumb Marks Podcast. All right, guys, we're running down here, coming to an end of the first episode of the Dumb Marks Podcast. We greatly appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to us. And uh, Chris, why don't you give the listeners here a breakdown on what they can expect from us going forward? All right, so you know today we talked about uh, AEW All Out, gave our recap on that, gave you a little bit of uh, this week in wrestling as well. Uh, we hope you liked our Drink of the Week segment, and we covered the upcoming NFL season. Um, I think that gives you a little bit of expectations of how the show is going to run every week. Um, you know, if there's anything that you want us to discuss every week, uh, you know, leave us a comment on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, work. Or any comments that you want to leave on anywhere where you found this podcast. Um, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Simplecast, SoundCloud, TuneIn, Deezer, Player FM, Stitcher, and Pocket Cast. Uh, Dumb Marks Podcast will be coming soon to Amazon Music and hopefully Google Podcasts as well. Um, you know where you found us. I think uh, everybody knows... You know, where they like to listen, we'll be posting these shows on Facebook every week and YouTube. Um, See, is there anything that you want to wrap up for this week? Yeah, thanks for that breakdown, Chris. And, you know, guys, just uh, words of wisdom to leave you with here to wrap up the show. You know, the great rapper Nasir Nas, Nasty Nas, a.k.a. Escobar, once said, street dreams are made of these. Who am I to disagree? Everybody's looking for something here's to you guys to continue looking for your something hopefully you find it and uh, until next time you guys can catch us around the way thanks a lot and that's a wrap for the first dumb marks podcast tune in again next week and make sure you hit subscribe Woo. glad that's over with hey dummy we're still live hot mic oh shit